Good afternoon. Hope that you've had a good day. We enjoyed being able to present a Bible lesson this morning and hope that it benefited you all who listened as well. And we are glad to be able to present a Bible lesson again tonight. We would like to study this evening from the book of Jude. I'm speaking rather slowly because I want to give time for people to log on. But if you're already with us and can hear me, go ahead and open your Bibles to the small book of Jude, only one chapter, 25 verses, right before the book of Revelation toward the end of the New Testament. That's where we'll be studying tonight, the book of Jude. We uh, realize there are some books that may get more attention than others, and sometimes even the small books, though they might not take much effort to read because of their short length, might not get as much attention. Maybe they do. Maybe you give them plenty of attention. I don't know. But uh, sometimes with me, I fall a little bit short in giving attention to some of these short books. The book of Jude, right before the book of Revelation, is where we'll study. I think probably that's long enough to wait, so we'll go ahead and get started. Let me start like this. I wanted to use the book of Jude not only to make our comments tonight, not only to sermonize a little bit, if you will, but also to give us sort of an object lesson in how things might have been done in the early church. At least we know how things were done in the synagogue. In the synagogue, which was the Jewish meeting house in many communities, except for Jerusalem, of course, the synagogue had a certain order of services. The synagogue, the synagogues came about because of the dispersion of the Israelites, the Jews. When 722 BC, when Israel was taken captive to Assyria, and then in 586 BC, when all of Jerusalem, except for a remnant, was either killed or taken captive to Babylon. When the people realized they were gonna be in these places for a long time, they built synagogues as places of worship. It just means assembly place. They became predecessors of our church buildings. When Christians started converting from Judaism to Christianity, you remember the Jews were the first ones to convert to Christianity. The gospel went to Jerusalem, and then to Judea and Samaria, and then to the ends of the earth. When, you, uh, when Jews converted to Christianity, some historians say that they incorporated the acts of worship that the Bible gives us, but they also incorporated the order and some of the customs of the synagogue. Now you say, how can you, how can you mix what inspiration says with, with a custom? Well, I think we can understand that. We know that the five acts of worship are singing and praying and studying the Bible or preaching, and then on Sundays, taking of the Lord's Supper and communion. And that's what the Bible gives us. But the Bible doesn't give us an order. The Bible doesn't give us a prescribed set way to do those things. It doesn't tell us whether a preacher stood or sat. It doesn't tell us whether there was one preacher or three or four men that made comments on, uh, the, on the particular scriptures at issue. It uh, doesn't tell you which songs they sang at which times. It doesn't tell you exactly how they passed the Lord's Supper. They, uh, they uh, may have passed it around the room. They may have passed it back and forth, you see. So there are things that are customs that could be incorporated, and yet you still have the five acts of worship. They may have had their preaching first and their singing later, instead of having their singing first to start off with, and, and things like that. We know that some of the early church met in homes because there had not yet been times for church buildings to be built yet, and some of the New Testament passages indicate that there were people meeting in homes to worship God, the church in their house, the Apostle Paul would say on occasion, uh, particularly of Aquila and Priscilla, he said that one place. And um, we know that sometimes, according to history, not according to the Bible, but according to history, if we can trust these historical sources, that the church would have to meet after hours in dark places, places like the catacombs where the graves were, in order to hide from the authorities who were ready to persecute them. Now, we also know a few other things about the early church. They did not have the full, complete New Testament yet. That's the key to what I'm going to try to get across tonight. I can look at a New Testament. I have several in my office. I could look online at one. I could look on my phone at one. I could look at several New Testaments and have all 27 books of the New Testament there, select a passage from which to preach, study it, 
carefully compare it to other passages in the New Testament, see what illustrations or analogies might be made from Old Testament passages from which we're to learn and prepare a lesson. They didn't have all of the New Testament yet till about 90 or so, maybe a little bit later, AD, depending on your, uh, depending on the way you date the book of Revelation. Well, what did they do then? Well, they used what they had. You can teach the gospel from Old Testament passages. Jesus did that. On the road to Emmaus, on the day he resurrected from the dead, there were two disciples that were wondering what was going on with Jesus dying. Before Jesus appeared to them and let them know who he was, he withheld their eyesight so they didn't know who he was, restrained their uh, connection between what they saw and what they thought for somehow for a little bit, and he opened to them the Old Testament scriptures to prove to them that the events that they had witnessed matched up with the prophecies of old. So the early church might use a lot of the Old Testament passages, read about them and talk about Jesus and talk about the things they'd heard maybe from Jesus or from his apostles. That was another thing that they did. Sometimes there might be an inspired apostle on hand to give a message or the apostles laid hands on people in order to pass on the gifts of the Holy Spirit. We know from Acts chapter 8, maybe one of those on whom they laid their hands might be at a particular service in order to give an inspired message. Or a third possibility is that they received a letter. We know that when Paul wrote the church at Colossae, he expected his letter to be read there. And he expected his letter to be read in another nearby church, Laodicea. And he had apparently written a letter to Laodicea that we no longer have, but he expected that letter to be read at the church at Colossae. So they might get a whole letter from an apostle or a whole letter from one of those on whom the apostles laid their hands and read it. Then they might incorporate the custom of the synagogue at that point. The custom of the synagogue was to read a passage from the scriptures that they had, and that's in that case the Old Testament, and then ask people to comment on it. We know that historically from secular sources. We also know it from the Bible. In Acts chapter 13, the Apostle Paul is in Antioch in Pisidia, and he is in the synagogue on the Sabbath day. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the synagogue leader says, Men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation, say on. Paul uses that to preach a great sermon on how the Old Testament led up to Christ. And then the Jews fulfilled the Old Testament by their demanding the crucifixion of Christ. In Luke chapter 4, you know, Jesus grew up under the old law and started his ministry and lived his ministry under the old law, even while he was teaching things for the new law. In Luke chapter 4, He's in the synagogue, and he has the scripture reading that day. He reads from a passage in Isaiah 61 about the spirit of the Lord being upon him and anointing him to preach the gospel to the poor. When he closes the book, everybody looks at him as if he's going to be the one to speak, so he takes the opportunity to speak. He began to say to them, I think it's verse 21 says, he began to say to them, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. And when it says he began to say to them, that seems to indicate to us that he spoke a little bit longer than that one sentence, but that's the Holy Spirit's summar summarization of that speech that he gave on that occasion. So the practice of the synagogue was to have somebody read a rather long scripture. We have scripture reading and comments, but our scripture readings are generally two or three verses at the most, and then a long sermon after that. But what they did in the synagogue was maybe read a longer passage, perhaps, and then somebody would comment on it. And then in the early church, you might imagine when they get the letter of Romans, when they get the letter of Colossians, when they get the letter of Jude, they just read the whole thing through to see what the apostle or the prophet has to say. Now, I can't illustrate that in the time frame that we allow ourselves with a book like Romans of, of 16 chapters or 1 Corinthians of 16 chapters. We can't do that. But Jude only has one chapter. So I thought we'd give it a try. So what I'm going to do is ask you to follow along as I read through the 25 verses in the book of Jude. Then I'll go back and be the commenter, someone who comments on a few of the things that we've heard. 
and I'll, I don't like to ask people to pretend too much, but you might imagine yourself in a situation where this is the first time anybody's heard this book. It's come from the pen of probably Jude, the brother of the Lord. Remember, Jesus had brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Mark chapter 6 tells us Judas or Jude, one by the one of them, and James, and he identifies himself here as the bondservant of Christ and the brother of James. So this is the first time somebody's heard it, you might imagine. And then somebody's going to comment on it after that. Let's read. Jude, verse 1. Jude, and remember, it wouldn't have had verse divisions back then either. It would have just flowed. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are called, sanctified by God the Father, and preserved in Jesus Christ. Grace, mercy, or, or mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. But I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. As Sodom and Gomorrah, the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil, when he disputed about the body of Moses, dared not bring in against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these speak evil of whatever they do not know, and whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts, in these things they corrupt themselves. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are spots in your love feasts, while they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They are clouds without water, carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit, twice dead pulled up by the roots, waging waves of the, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Now Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. These are grumblers, complainers, walking according to their own lusts, and they mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. But you, beloved, Remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And on some have compassion, making a distinction. But others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Men and brethren, if any of you have any word of exhortation, Say on, you might hear at this point. And if I were one who'd heard that letter at this point, maybe I'd have some comments to make. If I did, they might be along this line. Well, brethren, I know that he w wants us to continue to be sanctified, set apart from the world, 
and that he's able to preserve us in Jesus Christ. That is, he's with us, and that gives me great comfort. He wants grace, mercy, and peace to be multiplied, not just enough, but multiplied to us. And I might notice, brethren, it seems that he's a little upset with us about some things because he was writing us to be diligent concerning our common salvation, but then he says he found it necessary to write us, exhorting us to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. Maybe Jude has some idea that we've not been, not been standing as strongly as we need to. Maybe Jude has some idea that we've been giving in to some of these false teachers, giving them some leeway, maybe listening to some of the things that they've said. I notice, brethren, that he doesn't have very kind words for them. He says in verse four, he says here that they crept in long ago and they're already marked out for condemnation. They're ungodly men who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Have there been men among us who deny God, who deny Christ? Have there been men among us who turn the grace of God into lewdness? There were people at that time that turned the grace of God into lewdness, and there are those people here today. They uh, essentially tell you that because God has grace, we're all sinners, and they lead you to believe that you can just excuse any lewd thing in your life and expect God to cover that with salvation. Perhaps these brethren hadn't heard the, the, the uh, book of Romans yet, where Paul said, Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Romans 6, 1 and 2. So a person hearing this for the first time might be awakened. You know, there was that guy who was telling us that we just need to, we just need to realize that our bodies can't be really good and God will have enough grace to cover us anyway. And we need to not listen to that fellow based on what Jude said here. So I notice also, brethren, that Jude reminds us of a bunch of punishing that God did. He mentions how he saved the Israelites out of Egypt, but then punished those who did not believe. Well, brethren, we remember that from our reading of the Pentateuch. When God brought the children of Israel up out of Egypt, it wasn't long before they started complaining. And some of them did not want to go into the land of Canaan because they thought that the people inhabiting it were too big and too numerous for them to conquer. And God punished them by not letting them go in. He let the next generation go in, but not them. And, and brethren, I don't know about this angel's comment, someone might say. Uh, I don't know how God allowed the angels to leave, but I believe it because it's from Jude, and we, we, we trust him. We know how the, the angels then must have left their domain and rebelled against God, and God has reserved them for punishment. And maybe these folks, these Christians had already read the Gospel of Matthew. It probably would have been written many years before Jude was. Maybe they'd already read the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus spoke of the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels in Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. So God knows how to punish people even though they start out believing in him like the Israelites did and the angels did and God knows how to punish people and leave them as an example for us. Y'all remember Sodom and Gomorrah, don't you? We know it as Genesis 18 and 19. Well, they, why were they punished? They gave themselves over to sexual immorality. And that's what Jude's telling us about. Don't turn the grace of our God into lewdness or sexual immorality. It's not going to work because God knows how to punish that thing. And they'll, they'll suffer the vengeance of eternal fire. Then, after giving those three examples, he turns back to the modern people he's concerned about and says... Likewise, also these dreamers defile the flesh, reject authority, and speak evil of dignitaries. You know, brethren, he might just be going in reverse order of what he just said there. These people defile the flesh, just like people did in Sodom and Gomorrah. These people reject authority, just like the angels did when they were rebelling in heaven and got kicked out. And they speak evil of dignitaries, just like the Israelites did when they rebelled against Moses and Aaron. Then he gives examples of what should have been done. Yet Michael the archangel in contending with the devil when he disputed about the body of Moses dared not bring 
against him a reviling accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Now, in what we have as the Old Testament, which is the inspired Old Testament, we don't have that incident recorded. We have Michael the archangel that comes up in the book of Daniel, but we don't have this particular incident where he disputed about the body of Moses with the devil. Some people have conjectured that maybe when Moses was buried at a spot that nobody knew, that maybe the devil wanted Moses to be buried at a spot that people would know, tempting them to idolize the burial spot. That's possible. I don't know that the early church would have thought about that too much. Maybe we thought about that. And we don't know that, we know this, just because it's not recorded in the Old Testament doesn't mean it didn't happen. The Old Testament's wording leaves a lot of things open to us, things that may have happened that we just don't need to know. Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and our children, that we may do all the words of this law. So apparently there was a dispute between Michael the archangel and the devil about what to do with the body of Moses, and Michael the archangel did, did not even disrespect the devil in that. And yet these false teachers come in and respect the chain of authority, just like the angels disrespected God, the Israelites disrespected Moses, and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah disrespected basic natural morality. And then he goes on to say, but these speak evil of whatever they do not know. And whatever they know naturally, like brute beasts in these things, they corrupt themselves. They, speak, they, they, they talk about things they don't know about. They speak evil of things they don't know about. And what they do know, they just make it into something that's corrupt. They have dirty minds, and their minds always lead them in those places. Then he says, Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, have run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. They'd know that. Gone in the way of Cain, you become jealous and become a murderer. Run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. Remember Balaam from this morning's lesson? He was wanting to be paid to curse the children of Israel. And they perished in the rebellion of Korah. So they had Korah and his men rebelled against Moses, saying they're taking too much upon themselves. And Korah and his men ended up being swallowed up. These false teachers, the early commentator might have said, are running in the way that some of these old characters have done, and we've been giving them an opening, and we need to stop. Jude says we need to stop. Then Jude, brethren, I notice, has some rough things to say about these characters. These are spots in your love feasts. It was a common early church practice to bring together a meal when they came together, and to keep that meal separate from the worship service, but to do it basically at the same time. And sometimes that got a little discombobulated, such as in 1 Corinthians 11, where they made the error of mixing the common meal with the Lord's Supper. And that's when Paul told them, don't you have houses to eat in? Well, they were mixing the common meal with the Lord's Supper. They had love feasts together, the agape feasts, is what the original Greek word is here, and some of the historians came to call it that, the agape feast. Well, the point here is not the feast. The point is there are spots in your love feast. You're eating with them. You're greeting them. You're allowing these people a foothold in your hearts, in your minds, and then their doctrine a foothold in your doctrine. Well, they feast with you without fear, serving only themselves. They may pretend to serve you, but they're really only after their own belly. They are clouds without water. <laughs> In other words, they're empty. Carried about by the winds, late autumn trees without fruit. They're useless. Twice dead, pulled up by the roots. You've seen, a, you, you've seen a trees that die, and then they're pulled up by the roots. Twice dead, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame. They just make a lot of noise. And when they make that foam that's supposed to be pretty on the sea, all it is for them is their own shame. Wandering stars for whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. They're not even going to light up the sky. Jude has some rough words for these characters. 
Then he tells us about an incident that isn't in the Old Testament, but is in some of the apocryphal literature. And some people have taken this next incident to say that that apocryphal literature ought to be inspired, we ought to regard it as inspired as well. Well, not necessarily so. The apocryphal literature, the literature between the Testaments like First and Second Maccabees, is not inspired, but it does have some historical events recorded in it. And maybe there was a, a book that recorded something about this, and maybe it really did happen, even though God didn't place it on par of being inspired literature. Here's what he says. Now, Enoch, the seventh from Adam. Remember Enoch, he walked with God and did not die. He just was not. He was the seventh from Adam. Let's see, Adam, Seth, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalalel, Jared, Enoch. Yeah, he was the seventh from Adam. And Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Even Enoch said this, even though it's not recorded in the Old Testament. He said to watch out for these kind of ungodly people. They've always been around. And even though we have this new covenant, even though we have this new message from the Lord, even though we live in the time of the fulfillment of the mystery of God, we're still going to have people like this. These are grumblers, verse 16, complainers, walking according to their own lusts. They mouth great swelling words, flattering people to gain advantage. Do we have those kind of people in the 21st century? We do, don't we? They fill their supposed church buildings. They fill their convention halls. And they're just flattering people, telling them how they can live their best lives. They have a health and wealth gospel, and they don't care about people's morality as long as the money keeps coming in. But you, beloved, remember the words which were spoken before by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how they told you that there would be mockers in the last time who would walk according to their own ungodly lusts. These are sensual persons who cause divisions, not having the spirit. So I was trying, Brethren Jude says, I was trying to write to you about just being diligent and faithful, and I found that I have, I'm going to have to spend most of my letter on telling you about these false teachers that are infiltrating you, how they're ungodly, sensual, lewd, sexually immoral people that are just trying to flatter you to gain some kind of religious advantage over you and use religion as a tool for satisfying their own lusts. Stay away from them. They're clouds without water. They're waves carried by the sea, foaming up with their own shame. But now, toward the end of the letter, he gets to his original purpose of exhorting them to continue in the common salvation. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. People make a lot out of verse 20 to try to make it some sort of special thing about praying in the Holy Spirit. They make it some sort of magical, miraculous thing. It isn't that. Look at what it is in context. These people who are divisive, sensual, evil, they're divisive, sensual, evil because they don't have the Spirit. Those are the last words in verse 19. Right before he tells the faithful people to pray in the Holy Spirit. You do have the Holy Spirit. You're being faithful to God. You're understanding. You're trying to grow. We know that the Spirit intercedes for us when we don't know what to say, Romans 8, verse 26. But I'm not even sure that's in reference here. He's just saying these evil people are infiltrating you, pretending to be Christians who have the Holy Spirit. They don't, but you do. So stay faithful. And stay faithful to keep that Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God. Well, is it possible to leave the love of God? Well, not, not really. We do have those passages that, passages that uh, say these six things the Lord hates and seven are an abomination to him. And a couple of those people, a divisive person is one of those in Proverbs 6, verses 16 through 19. We want to keep ourselves in the love of God by doing the things he wants us to do. If we love him, keep our commandments. We love him because he first loved us, John 14, 15 and 1 John 4, 19. And on some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment defiled by the flesh. 
Now, here's a distinction that you make. Some people you speak to with compassion. Other people you might have to speak to a little bit more harshly. As if you were outside a house, they were inside the house, the house was on fire, and you're telling them to get out of the danger zone of the fire. You're not going to speak in soft voice and say, please, I'd love for you to come out of that fire. I think it would just be great for you to come out of the fire at this time. No, you're going to yell and you're going to be urgent. You're going to demand that they get out of that fire. You're going to try to get their attention with some tougher words. Jude says there's a place for both. And isn't that what he's exactly done in this letter? Mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. But these are brute beasts, and they are spots in your love feasts, and they, they don't respect authority. And these are people who are just about their own lewdness, and they're ungodly men who do things in an ungodly way and have, are ungodly sinners. He's done the exact same thing right here. Now, I want to be real careful about that. There are people maybe that might be close to me, that might do things that are out of line, that I might feel able to, if the time is right, speak a little more roughly to try to wake them up to their sin. But I also have to remember Paul's words in 2 Timothy 2, not to quarrel with people, but be gentle and compassionate to all. We have to have a balance in Scripture, don't we? And that's what he's saying here. Make a distinction. On some have compassion, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire. Now, to him, brethren, at the end, he gives us encouragement. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who is alone wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Eh, amen, the crowd might say. The, crowd, the church might say amen to that. God does have power. God alone has power. God alone has dominion and glory. And the commenter might point out, God is able to keep us faultless. We don't have to give in to these people. They might be all around us. They might be tempting us. They might be smooth-tongued. They might be powerful in influence. But God is able to keep us faultless doesn't mean we won't sin, but it means he can forgive us. God is able to keep us. So, I was very diligent to write to you concerning your common salvation, but I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered. Even at that time before the New Testament was complete, the system of faith had been delivered. Might all, not all have been revealed to everybody on earth yet at that time as the letters circulated but it would be soon enough for the holy spirit to say it's once for all delivered you know what that means for 21st century people like us there was no revelation to an angel in the americas in the 1800s there was no revelation to an arab in the 600s in mecca there was no revelation after the apostles and everybody on whom they laid their hands died. This is it. And it's sufficient to make a person complete before God. Second Timothy 3 verses 16 and 17. And so now, now when we have our worship services, we do the same things that they did. We might incorporate a little bit of different custom from country to country, from time to time, but we do the same acts of worship that they did. And when somebody stands to comment on the scriptures, he cannot assume his own authority. He cannot back up things by saying, an angel told me. He cannot back up things by saying, the spirit told me. He cannot back up his statements and his claims and his proclamations by claiming some vision from an angel. No, he has to refer to the word of God because it was once for all delivered to the saints. It's an ancient book but it's always relevant. You read it. You read that book tonight. Didn't that kind of sound like today? It sounded like America, didn't it? it? Sounded like Western civilization. We can learn from it. We can grow from it. And we can keep ourselves in the love of God because God is able to present us faultless in the last day. Would you pray with me, please? 
Father, we thank you for the day that you've given us and for our ability to study your word. We thank you so much for loving us enough to teach us and to warn us and to not hold back when we need warned rather forcefully because we desperately want to be with you in heaven and we don't want to let any temptation, any false teaching, any error get in the way of that. So thank you for being disciplinary toward us at times. Father, we pray that you will help us to be strong, help us to have mercy, peace, and love multiplied among ourselves. Show it to the world that more of the world might believe. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're studying the Bible and would like some more study, we'd love to help you study. We won't tell you things without backing them up in Scripture, and we'll ask you to study the Scripture and make sure that what we're saying is true. If you are ready to become a Christian, believing in Christ and ready to repent of your sins, ready to confess Him before men and be baptized for the remission of your sins, don't hesitate. Don't put it off. Contact us and we'll assist you with that. If you've been unfaithful to the Lord and are ready to come back to Him with repentance and prayer, don't wait on that either. If we could help you, let us know. We thank you for watching tonight. Lord willing, I'll be here 7 o'clock Wednesday night with a kid's class from 7 to about 7.15 and with a teen adult class after that. Thank you so much, and you all have a good evening.